All right, so that, that illustrates a kind of a vision, sort of a different take on the vision that I, I presented earlier. And oh, I think you got, it's the wrong presentation in here now, actually. That's oh, okay. But the idea is that with that take, and it's, it's obviously it's easier to make a movie of these things than to actually uh, make them <laughs> themselves. <laughs> so we thought we'd start with that. But then I'm, I want to dissect a number of those functions. And I think it's, it's our sense, and, and after working with a number of you to think uh, some of these things through, it's our sense that um, a lot of the, there's, there's low hanging fruit of basic functions that could be brought to bear at a national level that could already begin to implement parts of this. So what I we're, what really wanted to do was take this kind of, not frame by frame, but sort of function by function, and then take inventory. Do we have the capability to do this? So many of you are actually building out parts of that vision. And how we, might we create a framework to integrate that and figure out which pieces are missing that we really ought to focus on to make that sort of a vision come true? So just starting with the alert and notification. Um, this is perhaps not the central part of this, but it is something there are already such services available. So in astronomy, there are alert services um, from the virtual observatory and the large synoptic survey telescope is also, there's even an app for your iPhone now called Transients. And in fact, I used to, when I talked about the LSST, when I was at NSF, I used to get my phone out and say, well, you know, there was a transient event last night and it's, it's telling me on my phone. So there are many such services being developed. And so our idea would be, these are the kinds of things that could be integrated into sort of a, a, a national set of services, because many people don't actually know about them now, unless you're working very specifically in some particular community. And so then, uh, in terms of um, publications and data and so on, here, let me get my, my pointer here. Um, what we want to do is to actually link these things to um, data site DOI systems and so on. And in fact, Rick Luce is going to talk a little bit about things related to this going forward. So there are some capabilities already in place for this. Identity management. So we really want to make sure that in any sort of a national set of services that someone's local credential is actually getting them into the things that they need to be able to get into. So there are, of course, federated identity management activities in place on Internet2 and in common have been working for a long Long time on this. In fact, when I first went to NSF in 2008, I was thinking a lot about you know having NSF help bring this to reality, so that researchers on a basic uh, environment in their in their home you know math department or something like that could have access to national resources. So this is the idea of campus bridging of connecting local with national resources. But if, uh, there are uh, tools that you may see demonstrated in a little uh, few minutes actually around uh, Globus Identity Management where um, a, a more sophisticated set of uh, identity management relationships and, and tools are being developed that are in particular um, going to be deployed a little bit later by the Exceed um, project uh, funded by NSF. And so these would be very useful in allowing people to get into the national data services. Of course, there are many, many things, and, and the national data services would not itself focus on developing them all, but provide particularly search and discovery mechanisms that work with your individual repositories so that we can figure out how to go across them. So we would be focusing mostly on how we would do data discovery through, through linking and through connections to multiple services. And Bill Michaud, who's from the University of Illinois Library, will be giving a talk on this uh, a little bit later, I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, but uh, it's coming up. So again, there are, there are services that are emerging that are already doing some of this stuff. So we would not think about, I think, ourselves focusing on creating the metadata and so on, but there are groups, for example, the RDA is working a lot on standards, and as those things are developed, if we could deploy some basic functionality, and I think for us it's all about the low-hanging fruit, what are, what's the minimal set of services that would enable a lot of these things to take place, then they would be picked up by communities and then driven in directions um, as, uh, as metadata standards and so on were uh, developed and matured as communities move forward. So going down into, um, into individual disciplines, um, our, our feeling is that we would incorporate, not duplicate, other work. So um, there are many specialized tools for analysis, for example, then available for specific uh, functions. For example, uh, we're, we're talking a lot at NCSA about providing analysis tools around specific communities that would deal with outputs of supercomputing simulations. So right now, somebody does a simulation on a, almost a million processors that outputs a number of petabytes of data and it sits there somewhere. There needs to be services around that. So again, we wouldn't necessarily uh, develop them ourselves, but we would work with communities to adopt them or to provide links to them so that they could be operated on and, and data could be 
be um, analyzed. Also, which repositories? We did talk about creating a sort of a, a few national repositories, but we would very specifically um, have a recommendation service based on some very basic metadata that the author of a data collection would provide that would say, okay, it looks like your data set would be best accommodated in at this campus repository or that one or this community repository or perhaps one of the, the more generic national services and so on. So packaging and managing new collections, I think this is a really important part of this. So again, some basic tools that are generic in the sense that someone could find a, a collection of data sets, some could be on your, your laptop, some could be at a national service, some could be part of a, a, a telescope or an accelerator project, you know, it depends on your community, some could be um, survey data. So you would pick those things and then you would be able to create a data collection, get a DOI, get an ORCID ID for, for who you are, and then you would be ready to go. So that's a really basic thing. Again, it sounds like if we're trying to do everything, this is one of the fundamental steps that's important for all of these things. And, and Ian will be talking about this very shortly, and, and you, you may see a, a demonstration of this as well. Handling messy data. So uh, a lot of data are really, really messy. In fact, most data probably are really messy. Uh, around very big projects, they're very highly organized. But uh, this is getting more the long tail and uh, also historical data. So in fact, there are projects out there, the, the uh, brown dog project, and there was a nice picture of the brown dog <laughs> that was uh, put in the movie. Uh, that's a project funded by NSF right now to use machine learning techniques basically to look at, meta, at, at messy data and to sort of derive metadata about that that might be sort of 80% good enough to really describe that in a good way. So again, this is a kind of a tool that we can incorporate. And in fact, in talking to George Alter at ICPSR, one of the, the things was, well, could you apply that to the literature itself and figure out which data collections were probably used but were not actually cited by the, by the authors because at the time that that paper was published, that wasn't part of the, the, uh, um, the culture. Could you find out which data sets really should be connected to the literature? So, so we'll have some talks a, a little bit later on, on messy data um, from, uh, from Kathy Davidson. Now, supporting data reuse. Again, there are tools available for having a data set somewhere and then migrating it to an appropriate place for doing analysis or potentially moving uh, computational capabilities to the data sets. And, and this is a, a widely used set of tools now developed by the Globus team uh, for, um, for data transfer and, and synchronization. And so again, we would say there are tools already in the sort of the national toolbox that haven't particularly been integrated in this context yet, but really could be. And so you hear more about this from, from Ian and, and from Steve Tiki. So for storage uh, reuse and sharing, um, we say that storage is, of course, uh, needed not just for archiving, but for all, all of this analysis. And I mentioned this already in a couple of other contexts, that we want this, the storage to be used for uh, new knowledge creation, for repurposing of data, for people to look at it to do things that were never even thought of by the initial authors of the data. And there are a number of projects already going on uh, along these lines. There's a DIBS project, again, uh, that's uh, called SciServer, coming out of Johns Hopkins. And then there's um, Dropbox-like sharing that's developed by, by the Globus team that al allows people to add additional functionality. So again, a lot of this stuff is sort of in place, maybe not necessarily quite at the level that we're talking about, but in many cases, I think you'd be surprised we could actually be begin to deploy some of these services at a national level. Um, creating a collection. So we want to make it possible for someone who has a set of, of data, um, different uh, data sources to create this collection. It might be available initially just for a, an individual lab and then perhaps with collaborators and we'd make it possible for people with the right kinds of credentials and you'd be able to specify this to say, okay, my collaborators or my larger community are able to see this or maybe only the the uh, people at my at Elsevier and the reviewers who are looking at this or whatever other journal I've submitted my thing to and then ultimately to make it available uh, very uh, generally. So again, there are already tools in place that allow these sorts of things to, to take place. Data for broader audiences. Of course, if we have national structures, uh, it will be much more natural for anyone to go in and say, aha, where do I find out about this kind of data? And then with, with structures we have in place already, like the Exceed project that does actually, it's a $120 million project just for digital services that connects, it doesn't really have its own resources, it connects many sites across the country. So this is a natural sort of structure and also things like Internet2, which has many member campuses. So by working with, 
big structures like that, we could allow a, a, a much sort of larger scale up of, of smaller scale tools that were initially developed uh, with uh, smaller um, uh, communities in mind. And so uh, among other, uh, Carol Palmer and, and Bill Cope will be talking about ways uh, that uh, people are actually already doing sort of data that crosses borders. So long-term um, persistent links. This is a really important part of the problem going forward, and this is in particular where the business model is really needed to think about. Uh, you know, when we first started talking to the American Physical Society, they're like, yeah, this would really be good, but how can you guarantee that 10 years from now your data repository is going to provide a service? Because our article will still be read, so your data needs to be actually connected there, of course. And so this is part of the um, of, of how we organize ourselves and how we fund it and who takes responsibility. Clearly, there's going to be a lot of responsibility on individual campuses. That's going to be, just has to be a part of it. And so part of it's going to be at the national level and part of it will be in collaboration with agencies worldwide. So this has both technical and sort of uh, business model aspects that have to be dealt with. But our attitude is, why wait until we have the business model to get the basic functionality going? If, if it starts to work and people use it, people are going to demand that it be supported and funded. And, and you know, as any, as any campus person knows, if your provost doesn't hear from all the deans that this is really needed by their faculty, it won't happen. So providing this functionality will build up the pressure to, to build that sustainability model. That's an important part of this. And so, of course, this is a community-driven effort from our point of view, and our view is the time is now to begin to build this framework. So um, we feel like there's a lot can actually already be done, but there's a lot to do, and hopefully those of you here can see your own kinds of projects fitting into this picture, and we're going to talk specifically about developing an architecture, not like the mega system, but an architecture that's open and flexible that begins to incorporate it. So this is one of the missing pieces that we, I think we can actually begin to build is sort of this architecture that's a more minimal structure that would allow other things to be incorporated into it. So I think um, if there are any questions, I'll take them, but maybe it would be better to just let Ian uh, get started uh, with the architecture talk, and then Steve will talk about, give a demonstration of some capabilities already possible.